Welcome back. You're listening to Get Real. I'm your host, Bob Callagher. Joining me in the studio today is a very special guest and personal friend, Hong Tran of Lee Hong Attorneys at Law. Welcome to the show, Hong. How are you doing? Good. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, we appreciate you coming. We've been asking you for quite a while to join us in the studio for for a segment, and we finally managed to wrangle you, only with the promise of lunch, but still... You came in, and that's important to us. We appreciate it. <laughs> I'm afraid of the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so we asked you on to, to the show today to kind of talk about um, the real estate uh, transaction from the attorney's perspective. You know, because a lot of our listeners and a lot of first-time buyers out there listening, they, you know, they they assume you involve an attorney in something, and and it's 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 a big it must be a big issue or a big deal, and it kind of scares them off a little bit. So we kind of wanted to let you kind of walk us through what a transaction is like and what you do. And I, I've got a few questions here for you. You know, just a, a general question. You know, how do you help as an attorney, a real estate attorney, how do you help buyers and sellers through the process? Well, it's um, it's a long process, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, from the from the very beginning, let's, well, let's take the buyers, the, the from the buyer's perspective, yeah. what we do for them and uh, uh, what happens before it comes to us. Right. So the buyer has to go get a pre-qualification, pre-approval letter to know that they qualify right. in some form or manner in order to purchase. Then right. they would uh, hire uh, one of the uh, awesome real estate agents um, yes. to take them around to see properties that fit their requirements or right. qualifications. Right. And then from there, they would um, make an offer. Offer gets accepted. Mm-hmm. Then the home inspection. Home inspection gets negotiated. Mm-hmm. After all that is done, it gets to the attorneys. Right. So here in Massachusetts, the it's usually the seller's attorneys that draft the purchase and sales. But obviously, when a seller's attorney drafts the purchase and sales, it protects the sellers. Right. Right. So when it comes to us, we add riders. We add language on there to protect our buyers as well. Hmm. And uh, when we add language on there, we want to make sure that everything that is negotiated between the buyers and the sellers through mm-hmm. the brokers get onto the purchase sales because sometimes you don't know what uh, what has been negotiated or what has happened That's true. in the time that before it got to you. And uh, sometimes you just get a blast of emails where if you don't read the emails correctly, if you don't go down all the way through the chains, you're not going to know what has been fully right. negotiated. So it's all about the details. Absolutely. Yeah. That, it's absolutely, it's very detailed oriented right. once it gets to our section. Right. And then right after uh, the back and forth with the seller's attorney um, and the purchase sales gets approved, mm-hmm. we would either call the client or meet up with the client to review the purchase sales because it's the the last approval and the last say in this is the buyer and they want mm-hmm. we want to make sure that everything is all included in there. Right. So when we review this with the buyer the last time, if the buyer catches anything that's not on there or there's a mistake in it, then mm-hmm. we, we would have to go back to the seller's attorney and make these changes. Right. So once all that is done, that's when the, the that's when we're comfortable for the buyers to sign the purchase sales. Right. And um, sometimes buyers are, uh, um, they don't have the time to come to our office. So mm-hmm. we would utilize one of our partner real estate agents who uh, can put this through DotLoop, DocuSign, or any of these electronic uh, signature systems that they utilize mm-hmm. to have our clients sign. Now, when our clients are signing this, they know the version that we have mm-hmm. reviewed with them and finalized. And from there, they would make their additional deposit. Excellent. Yep. And speaking of deposits, uh, who holds the, the deposit once the purchase and sales is signed? Well, usually the deposit is um, held by the seller side. Because mm-hmm. if the buyer is putting down deposit, I mean, it, be- it becomes useless for the buyer's side or the buyer's uh, agent or the buyer's attorney to be holding the deposit, right? Right. So it's usually the seller side. So it's, it's uh, um, some attorneys would hold the deposit. Mm-hmm. Some listing brokers would hold the deposit. Right. Yeah. But I normally like it when the, the listing uh, agent holds the deposit for the purchase sales as well because the listing agent is also holding the deposit for uh, the offer to purchase. So now mm-hmm. let's keep the, all the deposit in, in one escrow account. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so one of the things that we talked about before we got started today was, uh, title insurance. And I've, I get questions about this all the time on the mortgage side of things. And I'd love to have you kind of explain, uh, what title insurance is and what role it plays in the transaction. Look, there are, um, let me explain what title insurance is. And I'll tell you the two types of title insurance, which is the owner's title insurance and the the lender's title insurance. Mm -hmm. Title insurance protects you against anything that had 
happened to title prior to your ownership. Obviously, mm-hmm. you can't buy title insurance to protect you against the stuff that you do that that makes the title defective. Right. So it protects you against any of the defective titles that's not listed in the exceptions. Mm-hmm. So as a closing attorney, prior to the closing, we search title. Mm-hmm. We would order a title search, and title searches, and it keeps on going backwards. It starts from, let's say, right now it's 2017. It goes to, to I mean, 2019. You search 2018, 17, 16. You keep on going backwards. Mm-hmm. But you can't indefinitely go backwards. When do you stop? Well, Massachusetts, a thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Massachusetts says 50 years, 5-0. Mm-hmm. But the lender goes, hey, I'm loaning a lot of money. What mm-hmm. if something happened 62, 75 years ago that's not caught when, when the land was all together before it was all subdivided? What if something happened to this title? Or what if something happened to title within those 50 years that was not caught on the title search? Mm-hmm. I, the lender, want to be protected. So that's why the lender makes the buyer buy lender's title insurance. Mm-hmm. Well, if the lender is doing that, why wouldn't the, the, why, it, why wouldn't the owner get owner's title insurance to protect the owner? Mm-hmm. as well and when you buy owner and title insurance together there's always that discount for the um owner's title insurance that's why the owner mm-hmm. would get a higher protection mm-hmm. than the lender would but for um less of an amount right yeah excellent yeah. excellent now have you ever had to deal with any title issues that come up after the fact or is it usually relatively clean it's usually relatively clean if it's a normal purchase, right. but if um, you're dealing with a property where there was a short sale prior or there was it was an REO, REOs are, are foreclosed properties, right? Mm-hmm. There's usually issues in those things. Right. And some of the issues are, they're usually discharges. Mm-hmm. Um, let's say the previous seller owns the property, but they owe... Uh, mortgage and they owe uh, real estate taxes and they owe private lenders or they owe um, uh, contractors uh, mm-hmm. where they would put in the materials liens on the property. And if the, some of these things were not discharged prior and the, owner, and the seller has owner's title insurance, mm-hmm. we could have the title company go and do an undertaking, um, an indemnity under- undertaking for the current buyer uh, so that we can close the transaction. That's mm. o- that only works if you have owner's title insurance, right? If you don't, then oh, yeah. there's there's no one there to protect you. Right. And having owner's title insurance, the owners, the 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 title insurance company, they have the obligation to defend mm-hmm. if it's not one of their list of exceptions. So let's say if someone comes up with a title claim, something's wrong with title. Mm-hmm. If you didn't have that title insurance, the owner would have to hire an attorney to defend that claim right because you have to defend it right right well (laughs) what about lose by default right what about people that are thinking well if i have lender's title insurance why wouldn't that cover me that's because the lender's title insurance only protects the lender for the 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 value of what the lender loaned them the amount of money for right so let's say if if there was that title defect title issue Mm -hmm. and um it ends up that the uh, lender uh, or, or the, the lender's title insurance company loses out on that. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? Not only the lender losing on that amount of money, but the owner has lost all the equity in that house as well. I see. So so the loan amount would be protected with the lender's title insurance, but any equity you had in the property wouldn't be protected if you didn't have owner's title, correct? Correct. But the when you have owner's title insurance, not only does it protect you not only does it uh, pay out on the equity, it pays out to the full value of what you, you purchased the title insurance for. So wow. it's not just the equity. Oh, wow. Right? Well, yeah, I guess that's the other thing. You know, I'm sure people are thinking, well, what if, I only, what if I bought a house with no money down? Why do I need it? But just because you have no equity in the house today doesn't mean 10 years from now you're not going to have a lot of equity in it, right? Absolutely. And it would protect you in that case too? Correct. Or does it only protect you? Does it protect you to the current value of the property or only up to what you paid for it? It protects you up to what you pay for it. Okay. So it's just like any other insurance. Let's say you buy life insurance for $100,000. You passed away. Your right. family gets that $100,000, not how much you're worth, right? Right. Yeah. 
And that's and we're talking about a worst case scenario. We start, certainly don't want to scare people in the audience. Usually the stuff that you're talking about is not so much that you would lose your house or lose your equity, even though that's a possibility. It's not something that happens frequently. The bigger issue is that a claim is made against the property. And if you don't have owner's title insurance, you're the one that's going to have to pay to defend it in court, correct? Correct. And Which could the- easily run twenty. Thirty thousand dollars. It depends on what kind of title it is to, right? Or what kind of title defect it is to, right? And these things don't come up until the current buyer starts to sell their property because there's going to be uh, a, right. another buyer's attorney that's or lender's attorney that is going to research the title and find these things and say, hey, right. it's defective. Right, and there and we run into it occasionally too, where the previous um, uh, previous closing attorney or lender never recorded a discharge when a mortgage was paid off. And I would I would imagine that if there's an issue like that, title insurance would, would help out as well? That's one of the biggest things, actually, mm. because um, so on a closing, you would get the payoff, and then you send the lender that amount of money. It usually takes them 30 days for them to uh, send the discharge. Mm-hmm. Some payoffs include the discharge recording fees where the lender would mail this would mail the fee and the discharge to the registry to record. Mm-hmm. Some discharges don't. So they would they could mail this to the closing attorney or they can mail it to the owner. Mm-hmm. I've seen situations where the owner is holding the discharge, but they don't know what to do with it because they, no one has ever told them that, hey, if you get this discharge, make sure you record it or bring it to us so we can record it. Right. And it never gets recorded. And now... When the issue comes up, we have to go back and ask the title insurance company to do what's called the indemnity and undertaking. Indemnity is indemnifying the buyer and the buyer's title insurance company, and Mm -hmm. undertaking is taken on the role to obtain this discharge from that previous lender so that you can record this. And that is more common than people realize. Absolutely. Because, I mean, you're talking about a massive amount of paperwork that gets done on these deals. Even though a lot of it is electronic now, Whenever you have people involved, mistakes can be made. And these, I mean, you're talking, I I can't even take a guess at how many discharges are recorded in the course of a year in just the state of Massachusetts alone. Correct. Some percentage of those are going to get missed. Right. And what people don't realize, well, they're probably thinking, well, so you go back to the mortgage company, you have proof that you paid it off, shouldn't be that big of a deal. Yeah, but what happens when the company that you originally took the mortgage out from has been sold and acquired 19 other times and now no longer really exists other than a file cabinet in some warehouse somewhere? I've seen that situation where company A gets bought out by company B and later on bought out by company C. Mm -hmm. And they do assignments of the note, right? Mm -hmm. And so the owner of that mortgage would be, let's say, company C right now. Mm-hmm. But if company A goes and sends out a discharge, that's incorrectly discharged. Right. Or vice versa, if they never did the assignment of these mortgages because they're just buying each other right. out. So it's basically worthless. You, didn't, you haven't accomplished anything. It's still not Correct. binding. Yeah. They attempted to do it, but they did it incorrectly. So that's right. a title defect. Right. And that's where the title insurance would come in so that we can get the title company to go and fix that. Right, because you don't want to be the owner of a home chasing down some bank that no longer exists to try and get somebody to give you what you need to get that recorded. Correct. I imagine you want somebody that's doing this as their profession to make sure it gets cleaned up. Correct. Right. And um, I mean, if you don't know, you could be spending hours, weeks, and yeah. days. In a lot of time or a lot of money. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So at the end of the day, it's probably a smart choice to to buy the title insurance. It's always a smart choice, yes, right? Absolutely. So let's talk about the other things that you do to protect your buyers. You know, we were talking again a little bit before the show. Um, there is a financing contingency in the purchase and sales, and there's you know the the closing date, and those are the dates that we have to meet on the financing side. Um, tell us a little bit about why, even after a loan's been approved, you tend to extend the financing date. What's the purpose of that? So some attorneys think I'm crazy for continuing to (laughs) ask Mm. for extensions, even though after we get the mortgage commitment. Most of these mortgage commitments come in with conditions. Yes. Buyer, here's a mortgage commitment with conditions A, B, and C. Well, what if we can't satisfy one of those commitments and we never ask for an extension on the mortgage commitment? Mm -hmm. If one of those conditions are not satisfied... I don't want to risk losing my client's deposit. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, some of these deposits could be a lot of money. I mean, one thousand, five thousand dollars to uh, a, a, a transaction of five hundred thousand dollars may not be a big percentage, but for a buyer, mm-hmm. w- with with it being their first time um, buying a house, it could right. be a lot of money. I right. mean, it's it's uh, so we need to protect them. Right. And not until all of these conditions are satisfied, right. then uh, I feel comfortable to not ask for further extensions. Right. Which is smart. And you, you are smart to do it because you actually did have somebody, um, I don't know how recently it was, but I know we were talking about this a, a while back, that lost their job after approval. Correct. I mean, and prior, uh, during the whole mortgage process, the, yes. the lender uh, would get documentations from uh, human resource that the client is working. But right. a few days prior to the closing, the, the the processor would continue to check. I mean, they do the VOE, right? The right. verification of employment to make sure that the client is still working there. Right. I mean, what if the client has been laid off? Right. And that is one of the conditions. And it has happened. Yeah. Yeah. So in this in this spot, you your clients would be protected because the, the financing date was extended. And since they technically no longer meet the terms of the commitment, they would get the deposit back. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So it's all about making sure your 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 buyers are protected. Correct. And mean, and the opposing counsel understands that sometimes they would ask us to qualify our uh, extension, saying that uh, only under these conditions, A, B, C, Hong, because we right. don't want any other surprises. Right. And th- that's fine. That's, that's understandable. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, a couple more minutes. Uh, we're, we're almost out of time. I can't believe it's already been so, so long. Uh, I want to make sure I get a couple of things in here, though. Uh, your main office is located in Worcester, right? Correct. Uh, and you're a full service uh, real estate law firm. You do some other stuff as well, but primarily real estate law. Um, why don't you talk about the areas you cover? Because a lot of people are assuming if you're based in Worcester, that's probably what you cover. Uh, why don't you elaborate on that for us? Okay, so we also have an office in uh, Randolph. Right. Um, we're licensed to do closings in Mass, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm always on the road uh, doing closings. And uh, I was going to say that. Usually when I talk to you, you're either in a closing or about to go into a closing or in the car driving to a closing. <laughs> yes. So not only are you licensed there, you actually frequently do. You do a lot of closings in Connecticut and New Hampshire particularly too, right? Correct. Uh, especially, and Rhode Island. Yeah, yeah, Rhode Island. Especially with uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut, it's different from here in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, we actually have a registry where we register all the recording lands. And in Rhode Island and Connecticut, it's actually done at the town halls. So normally we would do a real estate closing at the real, real estate offices, and we would walk the documents over to the town hall to record. Right, yeah. which I was shocked at. I, I had no idea that Connecticut and Rhode Island didn't have those. Yeah, they don't. It's all it's all recorded and it's all kept at the town hall. That must make it interesting. <laughs> uh, I also want to give out your contact info too. Uh, why don't you uh, share the phone number, the best phone number to to reach you or sure. your company? Maybe I should give out my wife's cell phone number. No, my, <laughs> <laughs> my uh, company number is five zero eight seven nine nine four five two nine, and that's five zero eight seven nine nine four law. Excellent, excellent, and then. I think that's it, unless you have any final tips you want to offer us about closing and how to be prepared for the actual closing. I mean, I probably should have been a little more specific. Yeah, well, for the actual closing, make sure that uh, you bring IDs Mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, you bring either a bank check or you wire money into our accounts. And if you're going to be wiring money, make sure you're calling us to verify that uh, it is our wiring instruction because there has been a lot of wire fraud. Oh, yeah, that's that's a good point, too. It's, It's huge. Yeah. Thank you. That's a gr- lot of great information, Hong. Again, that was Hong Tran with Lee Hong, Attorneys at Law. We appreciate you coming on the show. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. We're going to take a quick break for commercials. We'll be back after this.